In the second module from the second lecture here today, we're going to work through first and second order integrated rate laws, and we'll talk about where they come from and why we need to have um, integrated rate laws, how they help us get a better estimate of our reaction data. So rate laws are really helpful. That They help us allow us to be able to calculate the concentration at any point in time, or if we have the concentrations, we can find the rate of the reaction. Um, we can find the concentration at any point in time in the reaction, in, even into the future of the reaction, if we have the integrated rate laws. And we're going to look at a first and second order reaction. A first order reaction, the rate of the reaction only depends on one reaction, one reagent in the reaction. So what does that mean, right? A first order reaction would look something like A goes to B, where the rate law for that is rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of A to the first power. That is a first order reaction. The reaction only depends on the concentration of A and nothing else in the reaction. And we could find the differential rate law for that, where rate equals the change in concentration of A over the change in uh, time, and that equals my rate constant times the concentration of A. But as we'll see in a second, right, we need to have a little bit better way to represent that data. And that's where we came up with integrated rate laws. So as we looked at that data on Monday, we looked at those plots of concentration versus time and we saw things like this. They were not a linear line. And that made it hard for us to determine the exact concentration at any point in time or the exact rate, right? So we could, we could make and approximate what that rate is at a certain point in time. What is the slope at that exact point in time? But you'll notice we're coming up with a straight line, a linear relationship, and it's certainly, right, that data was certainly not linear. So that is what we use these first order, these integrated rate laws for. for. So an integrated rate law allows us to determine the concentration and the rate constant of the reaction. We can even find the concentration at any point in time. Even if we haven't collected the data for that. And we get that by integrating the rate law for a first order reaction. So again, I'm not going to go through the calculus, but all we're doing is we're integrating that initial data, that concentration versus time data, and we're going to come up with a graph that instead of concentration versus time is going to be the natural log of concentration versus time. And that's going to give us a linear relationship now. Now that we have that linear relationship, we can get a better estimate of what's the concentration. And not only that, we can get the rate constant out of this information. So here is the integrated rate law for a first order reaction, the natural log of concentration at time t. So time t, a at time t, that's some point in the future. equals the negative kt, so k is our rate constant times t, which is our time for that reaction, plus the natural log of a0. a at time 0 is the starting point of the reaction, initial concentration. The important thing is, though, this is the natural log of concentration at some point in the future. This is the natural log of concentration of my initial concentration. So just be careful depending on what information you're given. If you're given concentration, we have to take a natural log of that. But the other important thing about how we've represented this relationship now, right? what does a plot of natural log versus time look like for a first order 
reaction, right? I already gave it away in the previous slide. If I plot the natural log of concentration versus time, now it should be a straight line because I've put this equation in the same format of y equals mx plus b, right? I should have a linear relationship now if I plot the natural log of concentration versus time, where y equals, right, my concentration, my ln of A at some point in the future, M equals my negative K, X is time, and my Y-intercept, right, B is the natural log of my initial concentration. So now, in this format, we should get a linear relationship between the natural log of concentration versus time. And that's helpful because now, right, if I only collected this data through this time right here, now that I have a linear relationship, I could find out what's the concentration at time out here, or what's the concentration at time out here. I could find the concentration at any point in the future, and because it's a linear relationship, I could also find the change in concentration right, more accurately over the course of that reaction. So let's take a look at a first order reaction, the decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide into nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. That is a first order reaction. So here's a plot that I made of this data on Excel. Concentration versus time. Pay very close attention to the X and Y axis. Well, mostly the Y axis concentration versus time, and then I did a, a linear plot just to show you that this data is not linear, right? This data is not linear. So because of that, right, it's hard to come in and make that triangle and say, okay, here's my change in concentration, here's my change in time, here's my slope of that, here's the rate constant, here's the concentration. That's hard to do because it's not a linear relationship if I plot concentration versus time. What do I need to do, right? I need to take the natural log of this concentration and plot that against time. And so here's that data there. I take the natural log of concentration, right? Now paying very close attention to the y-axis. I've taken natural log of concentration and plotted that versus time. And you'll see now I have a linear relationship between those two. And not only that, I can get an equation for this line. It's a straight line. I can get an equation. And from that equation, I can get the rate constant for that reaction, right? Remembering in the form of Y equals MX plus B, right? So the slope, remember rate equals my rate constant times the concentration. My rate always needs to be a positive value. So because concentration is also positive, my rate constant also needs to be a positive value. So K is the negative of the slope. So a negative and a negative turn into a positive. So the slope for this reaction gives me the rate constant for the reaction. I get a rate constant of 5 times 10 to the minus 4 um, inverse seconds. So now I could find right? What is the concentration at some point in time in this reaction? Now that we have this in a linear relationship of natural log of concentration versus time. So here's a question for you. Given that we have this following information from the reaction of dinitrogen pentoxide, what is the concentration of the dinitrogen pentoxide at 3,200 seconds into the reaction? So we know it's a first order reaction, right? We want to use the integrated rate law for a first order reaction, right? So what we have is the natural log of concentration at time t. That's what we're looking for because we want to know what's the concentration at 3200 seconds. We know that equals, well, the rate constant for the reaction, we got that from the slope, is negative 5 times 10 to the minus 4 inverse seconds time, well, 3,200 seconds into the reaction. And here's where we have to be careful. 
we want the natural log of our initial concentration. Well, we've already plotted that information as natural log. So instead of taking the natural log of concentration, we can just already take that number. We know the y-intercept is negative 3.3. So that is not the concentration, that is the natural log of our initial concentration. So plus negative 3.3, again, we already took the natural log of that concentration. So instead of taking the natural log of that number to get that, we already have that natural log. So do a little multiplication and addition, and we get the natural log of concentration at 3,200 seconds equals negative 4.9. And for the last, this has been a test for the last two years now. I've mentioned this in lecture and still given it on an exam and I still have it happen. So I'll ask this question on the exam and 20% of the class will leave the answer as this. They will leave the answer as natural log of concentration equals 4.9. That wasn't the question I asked. The question I asked was what is the concentration? Right now you've answered the natural log of concentration is negative 4.9. So to finish this calculation, we need to remember a little trick from uh, our math class that e to the ln of x equals x. And that's the exact relationship we have. All that, that means is e raised to the natural log of concentration at time t will yield the concentration at time t. So that's all we want to do to get rid of this natural log. So e to the negative 4.9, right? Because the natural log of concentration at time t equals 4.9, I can replace, right, this natural log of concentration at time t with 4.9 because those two are equal. So e raised to the negative 4.9 gives me a concentration of approximately 7.4 times 10 to the minus three molar for the dinitrogen pentoxide. So again, be careful in your calculations that equals the concentration at 3200 seconds into this reaction. Be careful on your calculations and that you remember that last step because so many people will leave it one step short. You are on the right track you just answer the question as natural log of concentration when we want to know what is the concentration. A second order reaction, a second order reaction will look like two different types of reactions. We could have a reaction where I have 2A goes to B and the rate law would be rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of A squared. That would be a second order reaction, or you could have a reaction where we have A plus B goes to C, where it's first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. Overall, that's a second order reaction. Again, we're gonna do the same process. I look at that data. It does not give me a linear relationship if I plot concentration versus time for that reaction. So I'm gonna integrate that data and come up with an integrated rate law. And that integrated rate law, also written in the form of y equals mx plus b, is 1 over my concentration at time t in the future equals my rate constant, which is my slope, times time, plus my 1 over my initial concentration. But again, the important thing here is now that I've put this into the form of 1 over concentration versus time, I should have a linear relationship if indeed it is a second order reaction. Right, so again, I, I kind of jumped the gun and answered this question for you, but what does a plot of one over concentration versus time for a second order reaction look like? Right, it should represent, it should yield a straight line. And what is K? Right, K is our slope right, for that reaction. So now if I plot the integrated rate law, if I use the integrated rate law for a second order reaction, I can get the slope of that line, that slope would give me the rate constant, and then I'm on my way to calculating what's the concentration at different points in time during the course of that reaction. 
So here's a second order reaction process, the decomposition of nitrogen dioxide at 300 degrees. So nitrogen dioxide breaks down to give me nitrogen monoxide and half of an oxygen. So here's my concentration data as a function of time, right? This doesn't really help me. I need to plot that to kind of get a little bit more information from this reaction. So I'm gonna take this information and I'm gonna just try, right? Maybe it's not a second order reaction, maybe it is first. So let's just try plotting this as natural log of concentration versus time. So I plot this data, natural log of concentration versus time, right? This is clearly not a first order reaction. It's not a linear relationship, so this is clearly not a first order reaction, right? If it was first order and I plotted natural log of concentration versus time, I would expect to get a straight line out of that. I do not have a straight line. So now let me try plotting one over concentration versus time and see what that yields. So if I plot one over the concentration of nitrogen dioxide versus time, I get a linear relationship in this. So this process is clearly a second order process. Second order reaction because, this is very important, because I get a linear relationship between one over concentration versus time. That's a linear relationship because this is a second order reaction. So the rate law would look like, right, how does this help me? The rate law for this reaction would look like rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of nitrogen dioxide squared. All right, let's try a calculation now, now that we know this is a second order reaction. So here's a calculation for you. What is the concentration of nitrogen dioxide at 600 seconds into the reaction? And I already gave you the rate constant for this reaction. The rate constant's 0.45 inverse molar times inverse seconds. And I've given you the rate law for a second order reaction. One over concentration equals KT plus one over my initial concentration. To set up this calculation, I have one over concentration at time t in the future equals k. Well, k is 0.54 inverse molar inverse seconds. My time is 600 seconds into the future. And again, be careful with the next part of data. We're looking for one over the concentration. So I've already calculated what is one over the concentration at time zero. 1 over the concentration is 100 inverse molar, right? That is already 1 over the concentration. That's what that equals. 1 over the concentration is 100. So I've already done that calculation. So again, we multiply and we add. I get 1 over concentration at time t in the future equals 424 inverse molar. And just like before, I've done this calculation for two or three years now, and I've always said, I'll ask this on an exam, and I'll have 20 to 30% of the class get this question wrong because they stop the calculation there. You just solve for one over concentration equals 424 inverse molar. I was asking for what is the concentration of A? So I have one over concentration at time t equals 424 inverse molar. I'm gonna multiply both sides by the concentration at time t. All right, so this will cancel out and I have one equals 424 inverse molar times concentration at time t. Divide both sides by 424. And my concentration at time t equals one divided by 424 or 2.4 times 10 to the minus three molar. So again, be careful what you're asked for and what you're calculating. It has proven to be a problem in the past. Always pay attention to the units 
And like I said, what, what are you being asked for and what did you find in that calculation?